1978. President Jimmy Carter brings Israel's Begin and Egypt's Sadat together for peace talks. Queen Elizabeth entertains an honored guest, Romania's maverick president, Ceausescu. In Italy, ex-premier Aldo Moro is kidnapped and murdered. The Shah of Iran faces a popular revolt led by Ayatollah Khomeini. And in Rome, the century's youngest pope, John Paul II, takes his throne. In November, U.S. Congressman Leo Ryan leaves for Guyana, in South America, with an NBC camera crew and other journalists. He wants to investigate reports that a thousand American citizens are being exploited at a village there called Jonestown, after its leader, the Reverend Jim Jones. Five days later, as they prepare to leave Jonestown, he and four of his party are shot dead on the tarmac. As the firing dies, Reverend Jones orders all his followers to drink a lemonade containing cyanide. 913 of them do so and die. The most amazing mass suicide in history. James Warren Jones was born 47 years earlier in Lynn, Indiana, a town in the Bible Belt. The only child of a mean old redneck racist, as Jim later described his father. He gave his first hellfire sermon at the age of 12 to an audience of children and officiated at the funerals of pets. Married at 16, he became a Methodist preacher with his own parish church in Indianapolis. That was taken away from him when he attracted too many black and poor new members. So at the age of 22, he proclaimed himself a socialist and opened his own community national church. Running one of the first genuinely multiracial churches in the country, Jim Jones gained a reputation for looking after the interests of minorities. He and his wife adopted black and Korean children. But along with liberal crusading ideas, a hint of madness was already apparent. Obsessed with a vision of the apocalypse, Jones moved to Brazil in 1962, when he read that it was the safest spot in the world in a nuclear holocaust. He left his church in Indianapolis in charge of his disciples. There they successfully set up a new temple and self-contained community in Redwood Valley, also listed as another safe spot in a nuclear war. Membership in his people's temple swelled to nearly 20,000 as his reputation grew, and he started food kitchens and daycare centers. He particularly targeted minorities. <laughs> Believing that the ends justified the means, he put on fake displays of healing and said that he was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Using classic brainwashing techniques, he bound his followers to him so that they willingly gave him whatever property and money they had. His services were dazzling affairs, with soul and gospel singers, dance groups, and celebrity preachers like black revolutionary Angela Davis. The size of his congregation gave him a political power base. During the 1976 presidential election campaign, he allegedly provided support for the Democrats and met the presidential candidate's wife. Local politicians sought his support and he became a member of the city's housing commission. But completely unknown to leading politicians, there was another side to Jones's activities. 
investigative journalists began to accuse him of running the temple as a private empire with bizarre sexual practices and savage punishments. There were also rumors of financial deviations. Cult members were being persuaded to give all their wealth to the temple, and the money was allegedly sent abroad from San Francisco to banks in Switzerland and Panama. It was asserted an officer of the city administration helped in the establishment of these offshore accounts. Millions of dollars were said to be involved. Jones became increasingly paranoid, and there were several spectacular defections from the temple. Nevertheless, Jones's political influence enabled him to keep going, and welfare agencies even gave his church custody of more than a hundred children. But the pressure finally told. A morals charge and massive press speculation made Jones leave San Francisco in 1977. For three years he had been building a village for 150 people in Guyana. Now he suddenly airlifted almost a thousand of his credulous followers there, including the children in his care. Once in South America, they were crowded into huts and forced to work in the fields from sunrise to sunset, receiving minimal rations. They were subjected to daily exhortations from Jones, who liked to be known as Dad, alternated with humiliating punishments. Little of this was known to local politicians who publicly supported Jones. Well, Jonestown to me is a community where seniors, young people, middle-aged people of all different races can live together in a harmonious way where there's no so-called generation gap uh, there's no sexism. The women do and perform as much duties as the men do. They operate heavy machinery. They uh, operate the metal shops, the uh, carpentry shops. They do the same amount of jobs. Uh, there's no elitism. So I can pretty much say it's a community that belongs to the people. But soon, angry ex-members were telling a different story. Punishments were described. Right. Little children are scared with this thing called Bigfoot. And what they do is, they'll, if a child has done anything that most children do, all children try different things out to see where, how far they can go. It's considered very bad there, and they're sent out to see Bigfoot. And they're taken into the, the forest, and it's down by Jones's cabin. And it's a well for, for drinking water. And the child, two, two people will already be in the well swimming, and it's dark and you can't see. And the child's thrown in there, and then the people that are in there will be grabbing the child's feet or pulling him down, making sure he comes back up for breath with the child's... I mean, that's incredible. And then the child, you can hear the child screaming all the way there, and then you can hear him screaming all the way back, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Father, I'm sorry, Father, I'm sorry, Father. And he'll get there and he'll scream and scream, and if he doesn't scream loud enough, how sorry he is. Jim threatens that he'll send the child back down. Uh, one of our concerns is, uh, the, of the Human Freedom Center is that it's so difficult to get any, anything in motion as far as getting protection for the people, getting aid to them. But we do understand that it, it's uh, extremely difficult for anyone to comprehend people being in a cult group, standing by, watching their daughter being beat 75 times as I did watching children being beat, microphones held to their mouth while they're screaming so that the, everyone throughout the building that are not in a public meeting can hear them scream also. Uh, going through electric shock treatment where they're screaming. Uh, it's incredibly difficult for anyone to believe a story like this. There were fresh accusations of fraud, in particular the appropriation of welfare checks from elderly members. One of the cult's former members was asked if this happened voluntarily. Voluntarily, only because 
they knew if they didn't do it, that they, you know, they could be beaten. Jones's wife put up a stout defense against the rising tide of accusations that almost all Jones's followers were being detained against their will. I only know Jim Jones as a man who cares for humanity. And I've known him for 29 years, and I'm, I was born into a middle-class white family. I'm a professional person. I work for the California State Department of Health. I have never been financially dependent upon Jim Jones, and I would not be here if I did not totally believe in him as a person. I am not a blind follower. She tried to explain the defections. I, can only, I, I, I cannot say why. I can say that I think that certainly when people get to the place where they can't uh, make the total commitment that the kind of life that Tim Jones lives requires and they decide that they do no longer want to be a part of it because of the total commitment that is required, not because he uh, is dictatorial, as has been charged, because if anything, he's otherwise. He's, he, cre he encourages creativity in people. But when the time comes, when you see a man that lives with the people, not above the people, and for the people, you come to a place in your life where you have to make a choice whether you're willing to make that kind of a commitment. And when you're not willing to make it, there's a certain guilt that causes you to turn against the thing. But the disquiet was. grew worse. And she says there are mass suicide rehearsals going on in Jonestown. For example, she says that Jim Jones has mass meetings and he orders everybody to take to drink a brown uh, liquid. After they drink the liquid, he says, that is a fatal poison that is going to act on you in one hour, two hours, whatever. Now I would like you to stand up, each of you, and tell me how happy you are to die for the glory of socialism. And, and Debbie told me she wanted to die so bad that she was hoping that this was for real. But then Jim Jones, at the end of an hour or two, says that was a test, okay, to see where your heads are at. And that's how Jim pe keeps people in line. There are SWAT teams consisting of 50 young men and women dressed in khaki. There's two teams of 25 each that, armed. that are armed with a 200 to 300 guns and that they patrol all day and all night the whole encampment and that Jim Jones has stated publicly that nobody better try to escape from here because you will be shot. The temple's attorney was publicly dismissive. There's no bodyguards around him in, in, in Jonestown. And there are no guns in Jonestown. I have not seen any guns. If you go there, you'll find that that's not true. I hope you can go there so that you can see for yourself. Finally, Congressman Ryan decided to accept the invitation. He set off with a party of reporters, cameramen, and four worried relatives. In Washington, the House Foreign Affairs Committee put his mission on an official basis, and Jones had to accept it or risk having his American funds cut off. On arrival in Georgetown, the congressman was greeted by a petition from Jones's followers asking him to go away. I assume that part of the tactic is the delay. He also described the Guyanese government's reaction to requests for help. And his general attitude uh, about this whole thing, at least to me, was that uh, it's a matter from now on between the American Embassy and all of you. In other words, you're here, you've all been allowed to come in, and you're welcome, and uh, including the press, and uh, we hope that's the last we'll have to deal with problems. Then the congressman asked the U.S. Embassy for assistance. I'm trying to get the ambassador to follow through a little further on what he said about uh, wanting to be off the spot and being, and being the middleman and wanting me to deal more directly with uh, Jonestown. And I agree with him completely. The party landed at Port Kaituma airstrip near Jonestown on the 17th of November. Ryan explained why he had come. To inquire into the uh, health and the welfare of American citizens who are here. Once their credentials had been approved by local government officials, the party was greeted by the temple's legal representatives. Today or tomorrow, we'll try to do it, if we can. Then they were escorted into Jonestown, the place described by its founder as heaven on earth.
There, an elaborate charade had been rehearsed for them, a well-run nursery. Happy dancers. Are you happy here? Yes, I'm very happy here. Satisfied members who denied that they were being kept against their will. Well, I'm very happy here. I don't know what else I can do to convince them. I've talked to my brother several hours now. In fact, I invited him down here about a month and a half ago to spend a week or two or however long he wanted with me to share with him what I'm doing here and the happiness that I feel. You know, I'm very happy for him to come down here any time. He's asking me to come back to the United States to spend a week to convince him and my family that I'm not being held here against my will and I don't plan to return at this time to convince anybody because I know I'm happy here and I know my mind. At first, Ryan seemed to accept what he was being shown, and his speech broke the tension. I can tell you right now that from the few conversations I've had with some of the folks here already this evening, that uh, whatever the comments are, there are some people here who believe that this is the best thing that ever happened in their whole life. But after a few hours, he and his party began to feel that Jim Jones was staging the show for their benefit. By next morning, the production began to fall apart. Jones reacted angrily when shown a note from a cult member asking the party for help to get away. Someone came and passed me this note. Well, that's who we're talking about. He wants to leave his son here. If Jones sounds such a bad place, why does he want to leave his son here? He's the one that I'm just talking about. Here, uh, this, he's talking about. This, this is the man that wants to leave his son here. People what play games, friend. They lie, they lie. What can I do about liars? Are you people going to leave us? I just beg you, please leave us. Bill, we will bother nobody. Anybody wants to get out of here, can get out of here. We have no problem about getting out of here. They come and go all the time. I don't know what kind of game. People like, who, who, people like publicity. Some people do. I don't. Jones became cynical about the way the party would report their visit. But he said goodbye, apparently calmly. Then he whispered to one of his lieutenants. Before the party left for the airport, a man with a knife tried to stab Ryan. The congressman described the attack. Yeah, he said uh, something about uh, rob and choke and kill and uh, or knife. I don't, I don't know. But the obvious, what he said was he intended to kill him. The party had now been joined by about 30 cult members who wanted to get away and the enlarged party walked out towards the aircraft. Congressman Ryan went over to shake the pilot's hand. As the party waited, a tractor and trailer appeared in the background. Hidden men opened fire. Congressman Ryan Two reporters and an NBC cameraman were killed. Several other journalists and defectors were injured. Meanwhile, back at Jonestown, Jim Jones called his followers together. He told them of the congressman being murdered and that to avoid inevitable retribution, they must all kill themselves. His lieutenants prepared two 50-gallon drums of Kool-Aid laced with Valium and cyanide. Mothers gave the mixture to their infants before the adults lined up to take the poison from paper cups. Finally, only Jones and a nurse were left. They used a pistol to kill themselves. In all, 913 people died. Only gradually did the full extent of the mass suicide become apparent. Most of those who were first into Jonestown found it almost impossible to grasp what had happened. Early estimates of the number of dead had to be revised steadily upwards, as bodies were found buried several deep. Few survivors remained to tell their stories. Two had been too ill to get to the fatal meeting, 
a couple managed to slip away into the jungle. But almost all Jones's followers had gone quietly and obediently to their deaths. Jim Jones was continually saying, hurry, hurry, we must all do this, we must all die, we must die with dignity. Parents were uh, talking to their children and telling them whatever they were telling them, and a lot of the children were crying. And uh, he was telling them not to tell the children that they were dying, not to tell them it was painful. He was telling people it wasn't painful. Finally, the ghastly clearing of Jonestown was completed and nearly 1,000 coffins were taken back to Georgetown Airport en route to the United States. Among them was the body of Dad, who had persuaded so many people to follow him to the end. Over the United States, burials took place. In Oakland, 251 bodies were interred in a mass grave. Only one person, Larry Layton, was ever tried for taking part in the massacre of Congressman Ryan's party. The jury could not agree on a verdict, and he went free. The world was left to wonder how one man could so completely dominate his followers that they would willingly kill themselves. Jim Jones had set out to create an obedient community, and in a terrible way he succeeded. In the end, fewer than 30 of his followers wanted to get away. The rest were ready to die at his request. tape recorder had been left running throughout the last minutes and Jones left this final message. All that you are taking advantage of the 